Okay, so over the next couple of classes we're going to look at the process of trademark registration and importantly what is and is not registrable and the number of things that might prevent your proposed trademark from being registered. Can you think of anything that might stop your trademark being registered? Yeah, so that's one of the things that might stop you registering. So FC UK had some issues, because FC UK could be easily confused for fuck, and people were proposing that, well, maybe you shouldn't be allowed to register that. So that's one of the reasons you might not be allowed to register something. Can we think of any other reason why you might not be allowed to register a trademark? Yeah, so I mean, if I wanted to register Coca-Cola for drinks, um, the people that do the registration might reasonably say, well, no, Colin, you can't have that because somebody already has it. That's kind of the whole point of having a register. So there's a whole, there's a whole process there and a whole bunch of rules. What complicates things a little bit is that we have, like we said in the last class, we have both national and European systems running in parallel. And the rules, though, are so similar, actually, that often as we saw in some of the cases, a national court would send a question to the Court of Justice of the EU to be resolved, and that answer would come back as to the way the directive should be interpreted. But that's often applied to the way the regulation should be interpreted as well. Like, so really the national and European systems are influencing each other. No. So, a trademark is a sign used to distinguish the goods or services of one undertaking from another. And the important thing is that it can distinguish the goods. So it's marking the origin of the goods. It's a badge of origin. We sometimes conflate that with quality. You know, so jeans or clothes or tools from a particular manufacturer might have a good reputation but the mark isn't marking the quality it's a mark of origin it's a badge of origin and we may have things associated with that origin no so maintaining a register of marks provides a number of benefits the first one is that the ownership can be <coughs> presumed so if someone is the registered owner of the trademark, then we can dispense with the dispute over who rightfully owns it. The courts can just presume that if it's registered, then it to, if it's registered to Colin Manning, then Colin Manning is the owner. We don't have to get into a dispute with someone else claiming they own it. The priority might be clear. So before we had registers, if two people were innocently both using the same trademark and there was a conflict that arose out of that, the courts might have to decide, well, who, who had it first. But if you have a register, you can say, well, the first person to register it is the owner. You know, first come, first serve. In theory, that's something you can do. As it happens, it's not something we do in Ireland. In Ireland, the first person to use the mark is the person entitled to use it. And if you go to register a mark, someone who has been using it can oppose that registration. So some countries have a first use policy and some have a you know, register or feck off policy. But one of the main advantages is that if you are going to produce a product or you are going to develop a brand, you are going to put a, a mark on your goods, you can check if someone is already using that. So if I want to use, if I want to manufacture my Bishop and Castle chocolates that I talked about there a few weeks ago, I can go to the trademark register and I can look to see if anybody is using Bishop and Castle for chocolates. Now if someone is using Bishop and Castle for cars, that you know might or might not be an issue, but it allows me to go check. So those are the, the benefits of having a register.
So the process in Ireland and at the EU IPO is pretty much the same, although there are some differences. There are a few minor differences in the law governing trademarks in Ireland from, that's different from the regulation governing EU trademarks, and the process differs very, very slightly. But the general principles are the same in both cases. So in Ireland, you will apply to the Patents Office. Anyone know where the Patents Office is? It's in Kilkenny. It's in Kilkenny, yeah. So they, they maintain, I think they maintain like a kind of a post box office in Dublin, but the main office itself is in Kilkenny. And so if you want to file for an Irish patent or an Irish trademark, you, I was going to say you send off the paperwork to Kilkenny, but I mean, no one does that anymore. You just go online and do it online. So there'll be various parts of the process, and we will kind of look at all of those. Um, very, very briefly, I'll run through kind of just an overview. So obviously there's the application process, you go and you apply. There are formal requirements that have to be met. Um, there's classification, which we want to look at today, where you figure out what class of goods or services the mark is going to be applied to. Then there are two kinds of reasons to not grant a trademark. There are absolute grounds, which were like just looking at the mark, there's no way you're having a trademark for that. So if it's, you know, um, fuck is one of them, you won't get a trademark for fuck, and it doesn't matter about anything else, you're not having it. And then relative grounds are the trademark itself is fine, but there's an issue with trademarks already in existence. So on its own merits, the mark is acceptable, but there's a conflict with some existing mark. If you get through all those hurdles, what happens then is the mark is published in the journal or online. And that's putting people on notice. You know, Colin Manning is registering Bishop and Castle chocolates. <coughs> Anybody got a problem with that? You've got X number of days to speak up or be gone. So there's a time period then in which people can object. And that's the opposition period. And then if it gets through that, if no one objects, then it can be registered. Once it has been registered, someone can also object to the registration. So a mark can actually be taken, a trademark can be taken off someone years after it's been registered, depending on, on certain circumstances. But in the normal set of course of events, you apply, you've met the formal requirements, it's classified, there's no problem with the absolute grounds, no problems with the relative grounds, it gets published in the journal, um, nothing happens, nobody complains, a couple of months later you have your registered trademark. Okay. No. So, you can apply for a national trademark at a national trademark office. So you apply for an Irish trademark at the Irish Patents Office, or if you know, Boatini. And there's the German Patent Office, the Benelux Patent Office. Remember, we said Belgium, Netherlands, and the Luxembourg had pooled and formed one that behaved as a national office. In the UK, there's the um, Intellectual Property Office, it's called now. Anybody know where that is? It's in Newport in Gwent. It's not in Wales, it's not in London, it's in Wales. Okay? Um, Spanish office, Portuguese office, whatever. If you want to apply for a European trademark, you can apply to the EU IPO. It used to be you could apply for a European one at the local office as well, but they did away with that. They didn't have any particular problem with it, but it just it turned out nobody was actually really doing that, so they just simplify things, no bother. Okay, so you get your European trademark from the EU IPO. So, the trademark offices actually want people to be able to get a trademark all by themselves. So as a matter of policy, they want to make the process easy. The Irish Trademarks Office, I mean the Irish Patents Office, even holds clinics, you know, where if you want to kind of, you're a business and you want to register a trademark, you can kind of go and meet them and they'll help you with the process and everything. Okay? So you can do it um, all by yourself. You don't need a lawyer. 
and you can register the trademark online. So this is a screenshot there from the Irish Patents Office. And I think we mentioned last week, to apply is 77 euro, and then if it's accepted and if everything is okay, then you pay another 177, and that's good then for 10 years. And the EU IPO, I think it was 800 euro. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I don't seem to remember anything about a sort of an apply fee, and then if you get it, you pay the rest. You know, which would be nice. Um, I think you pay the 800 euro, and if you screw up, well, it's off. Mm -hmm. Now, so you can, you can do that online. You can also do it on paper, but um, nobody does that anymore. And if you do it on paper, they even charge you more in the UIPO. So um, the form is actually quite new. Um, they've jigged things up recently. The legislation sets out some formal requirements. You must actually request, uh, um, request an application for, to register. Do you mean? So I guess you could conceivably write a letter that met all of the formal requirements and they would have to accept it. It wouldn't necessarily have to be on the form, perhaps. Um, but you must have a, a request. You must clearly identify the owner. You have a, a representation of the mark, and this is a big deal. Some things are difficult to represent. A list of goods and services for which the registration is sought, and then the appropriate fee. So an important point, which I don't think I've made clear up to now, <coughs> is that you don't register, I, I mean, clear you don't register your trademark everywhere all around the world. Okay, it's country by country, or chunk of countries by chunk. But nor do you represent your trademark for everything. So if I was registering Bishop and Castle for chocolates, it, it would be f just for chocolates. Someone else would be perfectly entitled to use that for cars or farm machinery or whatever. So you register a trademark for specific goods and now services also. Okay. And so um, a trademark is only registered in respect to specific goods and services. So in Ireland we have a registered trademark polo, that's trademark 86881 and that's registered for uh, motor vehicles, parts thereof and fittings thereof. So car stuff, polo for cars, and it should come as no surprise that the owner of that trademark is Volkswagen. Okay. There's also polo suites. You don't see you don't see see them so much anymore, do you? Downstairs. Did they have them? Yeah, yeah I, I haven't. Shop, yeah, I haven't had some in ages. I haven't had them in ages. <coughs> so that's the um, the mint with the hole. So Polo is registered for sweets, so sugar confectionery and chocolate confectionery and confections, and that's owned by Nestle. And then there's also Polo as in Ralph Lauren Polo. So Ralph Lauren has um, a registered trademark in Ireland as well for various things, but basically uh, perfumes and aftershaves and whatnot. So those marks can all exist in the marketplace comfortably and they function fine as badges of origin. No one is going to be confused into thinking that Ralph Lauren has anything to do with the mints, with the hole in them. No one is going to think that Ralph Lauren is in the car business. Okay. So those three registered trademarks are in Ireland. I think they're all still on the books. And because they're in different classes, everything is fine. Different classes of products. Okay. So an applicant must specify the goods to which the mark will be applied. In order to make searching the database simpler, you have to specify the class of the goods. And the more classes you register and actually the more, the more you pay in fees. So if Ralph Lauren had wanted to get into the um, clothes business, which obviously he does, he might have registered Polo for um, 
you know, shampoos and hair stuff, and also for clothing. So there'll be two separate classes. As a general rule of thumb, the same mark can't be registered twice for the same class. So the entire world of possible goods and services has been broken up into these classes. And everything you could think of should fit into one of them. And as a general rule, if somebody's already registered the mark in that class, you can't register for something else in the same class. So like um, the class that has sugar, confectionery and chocolates, okay, like polos for mints, but I, I couldn't register polo for chocolates. It's already registered for chocolate, but... Um, so that used to be a hard and fast rule, but it's, it's a bit more nuanced now. So just because two kinds of goods are in the same class doesn't necessarily mean that they're so similar that the same mark can't be used for both of them. And just because goods or services are in different classes doesn't mean they're necessarily so different that you won't have a problem. So it's, it's a bit more nuanced than a hard and fast rule, but certainly as a rule of thumb, if you were giving someone advice, if someone wanted to register um, a product in a, that was in a particular class and another product in the same class was already using the same mark, you might say to them, look, that's probably a bad idea. That's probably not gonna fly might have to go pick something else. So I could, for example, register um, Bishop and Castle for sports cars. And I would say I'm registering it for goods of class 12, which are vehicles, apparatus for locomotion by land, air, or water. No, I could be specific and say that I'm registering Bishop and Castle just for cars and somebody could come along and attempt to register Bishop and Castle for speedboats because I said I'm only using it for cars it's not necessarily the case that because cars and speedboats are in the same class that they wouldn't be allowed but you could see how, if I was known for sports cars, it wouldn't be a huge stretch for the public to think, well, maybe I've branched out into speedboats, you know? So I would, have to, I would have to make that argument, but I'd probably be very, very successful at doing so. So you can register your goods for a subset of the things in the class. And obviously no one can register the same mark for the same goods. If they try to register the same mark for goods in the same class, it is, a, it is a, an alarm bell that there's a very good likelihood there of, of running into difficulty. Would there be a problem at a later stage splitting off part of that, say, apparatus for locomotion by land, air, or water? If somebody came to you and made you a great offer to buy a portion of the trademark because they wanted to start making speedboats. Well, you see, if I, I'm, we're, we're saying here now that I just, you can register for everything in the class or you can register for a subset of the things in the class. Yeah, so let's you, say I just registered for sports cars. Oh, yeah, well, then if somebody wants to make boats, that's great. But if you had yeah. registered for everything across everything, the class yeah, and yeah, somebody yeah. came to you and said, I'm going to write you a check if you... I could li I, I, I could license I could license the use of the trademark for it would it would be difficult to split the trademark registration into a trademark for cars and a trademark for speedboats. Yeah. But what I could do is I could say I'm going to keep the trademark, but I license you to to use it. Um, 
I could register it in, in class clothing, which uh, for clothing, which is class 25, or I could register it for gin, which is in class 33, which is alcoholic beverages except beer. Okay. Um, so there's this classification system called the Nice classification system, and that's a standard way of classifying all the possible goods and services. The services were quite new. So the th 1 to 34 classes are for goods, and then classes 35 to 45 are for services. The, the classification is updated periodically. So we're on version, I think we're on version 11 now. I gave you a printout of version 10, I think. I think there's a newer one. And in the past, you used to be able to say, I'm registering Bishop and Castle for everything in class 22 and people just kind of knew what that meant you know and every and that was that was a thing that you would do it's um it's become complicated lately um but i won't go into that just now but anyway, like i was saying as a general as a general rule if someone has registered a trademark in a class for, for goods in a class you would have difficulty registering the same trademark for other goods in the same class. I'm not saying definitely couldn't, but you'd struggle. Um, so a whole bunch of classes there. So class one, chemicals and whatnot. Two is paints, varnishes, blah, blah, blah. You have the print out there. You can, you can go through them yourself. <coughs> Every now and again, you see something and you think, oh, what's that in there? No. So these are the overall class headings. You can actually borrow down and get a full list of everything that would be in that class. So you can go to the website and, you know, umbrellas will have maybe a five or six digit code that starts with the class number. So you can actually see a list of all of the specific things that are in the class. So these are just the headings as such. Um, every now and again, you look at something that you think, hmm, that's a, a, strange, a strange place for that to be. Um, so if you look here, like class 10, surgical, medical, dental, and veterinary apparatus and instruments, artificial limbs, eyes and teeth, orthopedic articles, suture materials. Okay, that all makes sense. Um, devices and articles for nursing infants then sexual activity apparatus designs and articles so like condoms and all sorts of sex toys would be in with the surgical and medical stuff you know um, various things sometimes umbrellas too are in a strange place if, I'm not, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly um, class 14 there precious metals and their alloys jewellery Precious and semi-precious stones, clocks, watches, so that you could see all those being a group together. Musical instruments is a straightforward one, you know. Um, things to do with leather and imitations of leather. And class 18, 19, building materials. 20, furniture, mirrors, picture frames. Some strange stuff. Um, 21, household kitchen utensils. And you can go on. And then up to 25, clothing. Um, and so on, so on, so on. 30, coffee, artificial coffee, tea. Um, pastries and confectionery, edible ices, sugar. So beer and alcoholic beverages except beer. They're two separate ones. So there's a class for beer, mineral water, non-alcoholic beverages, fruit beverages. So like the people that devised this classification probably didn't really consider beer to be really drink, you know, as such. And so you then have alcoholic beverages apart from beers. Um, a whole class of stuff for tobacco and whatnot. And then services then from 35 to 45 very fairly broad categories altogether. Um, so most countries use the Nice system. Some still don't. Canada is still taking its time. 
No. So let's look at some trademarks and what they're registered in. So this is a trademark that was registered in Ireland in 1957 and it was registered in class 29. If we look on the list there, class 29 is meat, fish, poultry and game, meat extracts, preserved, frozen, blah de blah de blah, food. So class 29 is foodstuffs. They've just registered for potato chips. Okay. And so this is Mr. Tato. Everybody in Ireland knows Mr. Tato. Um, this was registered in 1990. And class 32, we saw there, is for beer. We just mentioned that, didn't we? So class 32 is for drinks. So And it's just registered it for beer and stout. So they specify the class. They have to say what class they're talking about. And then they've also specified the specific things in that class. Sometimes the trademark applicant will say everything in the class. Or just a subset. Okay? And that's the... More, do you have more subsets to get rid of it? No, it doesn't. But what happens is if Guinness registered this for sparkling water and didn't use it it could be taken off it so Guinness had no intention of ever making of ever using this trademark for sparkling water so it didn't register it for sparkling water How do you mean it, be taken off it? it could be taken off it if it didn't use it the whole class well, it would, it would have problems. So someone could oppose the registration for the sparkling water and have it taken off it. Also, they could claim not only did Guinness not use it for sparkling water, they never had any intention of using it for sparkling water, and that could undermine the whole registration. So you want to be as expensive as you can to get as much as you can, but if you overreach, you can end up in trouble. And it doesn't need to register it for sparkling water because if someone tries to register Guinness for a sparkling water, which is in class 32, I mean, that's not going to fly. So there's, no, there's no, nothing to be lost by not registering it for sparkling water. What's water in that? Well, or fruit juices anyway. I'm not sure if water would be in there. No, it is mineral and aerated waters, yeah. So you would register it for things you are going to use it for in the foreseeable future. And if you don't use something for five years, you can, you can lose it. Aer Lingus has registered this trademark in 1975 in two classes. First class makes sense, aircraft and land vehicles and parts and stuff, it's to do with planes, fair enough, it's an airline. Class 12 is um, vehicles, apparatus for locomotion by land, air and water. Makes sense that it would register in, in class. And class 16 is paper stuff and it's registered for that so people can't give out Erlingus napkins and cups and things okay so it registered the logo the, the mark in two classes the Kerry GA County Board has registered this trademark and it's black and white equivalent, actually, in a whole bunch of classes. And if you look, I think they just copied the, the, um, the same as the GEA generally. They just did the same, same stuff. So you can't make a screensaver uh, with this Kerry County Board logo on it. You've been fringing their copyright. Um, audio and video recordings, computer games. 
video recordings, computer programs, credit cards, phone cards, protective clothing. I can't see I can't see them doing much with that. But we'll see. I could be wrong. Um, goods and precious metals, so Kerry County Board, rings, jewellery, watches, I could see them, you know, selling those. Stuff made out of paper, definitely. Good made out goods made out of leather, an imitation leather, and key rings. I'm no doubt there's Kerry County Board key rings. I'm sure there's thousands of them around the country. Um, household or kitchen utensils or containers. Yeah, I, I don't see much now in the way of kitchen utensils. Although I can imagine a Kerry mug, definitely. Tea towels. Oh, Kerry tea towels, yeah. You go to tea towel. You would. Yeah, yeah. Um, textiles and textiles goods, obviously, class 24, clothing. Well, not included in other classes. All right, bed and table covers and flags not made of paper. Okay. And then 25, you have your hoodies and your hats and your T-shirts. I'd say if they had to pick one to make money out of, it would have been, you know, 25. Games and playthings. Yeah, I mean, you know, stuff for sports. Hurley, Schlitter, you can imagine all that. Christmas decorations, playing cards. All that makes sense. You'll notice there, it's, it's specified in class 28, Gaelic footballs and slitters. I'm sure if you go to the um, source document of the Nice classification, they've never heard of slitters. Do you know what I mean? So you can put stuff in there. We should put it in the right class. So it's clear that footballs and slitters go in there. Okay. And then education... Providing training, entertaining, sporting and cultural activities. Yeah, fair enough. So nobody can use this uh, logo for any of these products or services. Um, UCC registered this pair of trademarks in 2000. And again, we have some of the same things. Metals, key rings, pins dog tags and keychains, figurines and ornaments, okay. Um, similarly to the GA and Kerry, publications, jewellery makes sense, printed stuff makes sense, you know, your UCC um, notepads, whatever. Trunks and travel bags, bags, purses, wallets, handbags, rucksacks. Again, you're thinking merchandising stuff there. Photo frames, key rings, pictures, cushions, Placards, wall plaques, drinking straws, mm, a bit of a stretch, basketware, backsits and trays, duvets, pillows, bottle racks, all that carry on. Um, class 21, I guess you can have your UCC crystalware, your drinking mugs. 25, obviously, articles of clothing. 26, badges and buttons. Dolls, soft toys, playthings, board games, all class 28. So they really push the boat out. And then education, shock horror, I mean, they're in class 41. And then accommodation services, restaurant, bar, cafeteria, night catering, catering services, another one. So you can't use the UCC logo for any of those products or services. And I guess that kind of makes sense, you know. Now, what if someone use the UCC logo for something that wasn't on this list. Um, someone put the UCC logo on condoms, packets of condoms, and started selling them. Could UCC sue them for infringing the trademark? Because we saw the medical devices thing was, um, where was that? What class was that? Anyway, they didn't register it for medical devices. Could they sue them for infringement? Trademark infringement. I think so, because it's kind of misleading, you know? Are they infringing the trademark? 
Yeah. Should be for I mean, if they don't want to associate with condoms, then that could be their argument. I want to say no, but. We, we would all accept that the person that's doing that without the consent of CIT is doing something wrong, wouldn't we? But if they haven't registered that trademark for that class of goods, then it's not infringing the trademark. What kind of wrong is it then? It's passing off, isn't it? Like UCC has a reputation. If, if you saw a packet of condoms with the UCC logo on it, you might reasonably believe that UCC had something to do with the production of them and the sale of them. And you might be fooled. So if you couldn't get someone for trademark infringement, it may still be possible to go after them for passing off. But it's a harder, it's a harder thing to do. It's more difficult to um, win a passing off case than as a trademark infringement case. And that's in places that have passing off. In some countries, it's not registered, well, tough, you know. Also in some countries, if you register it, you kind of get it, it's almost implied you have it for everything. So different European countries have different approaches. I know UCC went, um, went mad there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look a bit again at the needs classification. Every trademark lawyer would kind of know, you know, 17 is this, 24 is this. You'd say something and they'd come back with you 19. Like they should know all that straight away. But what we'll do is we'll do a little exercise just to take a break from all that and open the door and get some fresh air in.